All right. Well, I'm a believer in um, starting on time so that because we're recording this anyway, if someone wants comes in late, we can catch the beginning of it. But uh, Taylor comes to us to speak and Marlene is going to handle the introduction. Okay. Um, Taylor Dena is an ordained elder in the North Katanga Conference, the Congo of the United Methodist Church. She holds a BA and an MA in International Development from the American University, an MDiv from Wesley Theological Seminary, and a doctor in Missiology from the University of South Africa. Her first book, Decolonizing Mission Partnerships, was chosen for the American Society of Missiology's monograph series in 2019. In addition to writing and preaching, Taylor teaches courses and seminars on healthy mission and evangelism models, coordinates the Central and Eastern European Association of Mission Studies, the doctoral colloquium program, and co-leads Friendly Planet Missiology. Taylor is born in the US, and has lived in seven countries and is currently based in Lejubana, Slovyana. Okay. Slovyana with her spouse, who is a diplomat, and their young daughter. Welcome. Thank you. Awesome. Well, Thank you. I'll go ahead and switch into the screen share mode and I'm putting your smiley faces just to the side. All right. Well, thank you, Marlene, for the introduction and thank you, Bill, for inviting me to be part of this series. Um, and hello to everyone watching this on YouTube. Uh, with the exception of Gina, who knows quite a bit about my family background, to the other, um, others of you, I'm, you probably don't know at all. So I wanted to share briefly a bit of the backstory so that you know the why this is important to me and how I came to have these understandings. And since it's a story that goes back over a quarter century, I, to keep myself disciplined, I did six photos as my touchstones for the story. In the early 1990s, I believe it was actually 91, my father, the late Reverend Dr. Bob Walters was invited to go with a group of clergy from Indiana to what was then called Zaire to see what the church was doing there. And he came back changed. He uh, had connected and befriended some clergy, Congolese clergy there, and felt at, um, in the core of his being that this was what God was calling him into, a friendship with these clergy, and that this was going to be the focus of the rest of his life, and is that is what it ended up being. So he started going back and forth while I was in middle school and high school. Finally, when I was in high school, I was able to go with him on a trip. So the, the picture on the top left, yes, that is me in the peachish shirt looking like a total Mzungu, uh, that <laughs> whitey, basically I look like a gringa. Um, very much so. All the cliches. That's me. And we were invited there. My, my father was the main key, keynote speaker. And the big thing at the time was a campaign led by the local Congolese church leaders for bicycles. Transportation infrastructure was a big issue. And so the idea was if every pastor could at least have a bicycle so that they can do all the things one can do when you have transportation. That experience, uh, I, I was only 15 at the time. That experience did change me. 
And it put in my head this obsession, fixation on why is the world the way it is? And I also sensed during my time there that there was something dysfunctional about the relationship between our, the American churches and the American missionaries there and the Congolese church leadership. There was, there was something that wasn't right, uh, but I didn't have the words to explain it. I, I, and I was a kid, but I decided in a very, in, in with the kind of confidence that a teenager can have that I was going to find out. And so when I went off to college, I majored in international development uh, with the idea that if I could learn what it was that was that was broken and what it was that we could do, that I could then bring it back to the church. Uh, a long story follows that and I'll collapse it. Uh, in 2005, I was finally able to go back. Oh, when I went off to college, my father went to Congo as officially as a missionary, but he didn't get to stay long because of the war. He had to leave. Fast forward to 2005, he and I both went back over there. I was the, the Bishop in Tambon Kulu put me up in the interior in a village. I was serving with the community development department and there I very quickly learned that my shiny new degree in international development <laughs> was pretty useless when you actually were in the real world. So I learned a lot of things the hard way. Fast forward some more, my father starts going back more doing bicycle tours with Congolese pastors, long trips where he, they would cover two to 3000 kilometers by bicycle in areas that had been hit hard by the war and where you could only get to by land cruisers during the dry season. Otherwise they were cut off. Uh, fast forward some more, I ended up getting ordained in North Katanga. I, uh, when I had left for the time I was there, I went to seminary, uh, I married a friend who convinced me that we could make our callings work and true to his word, as soon as I finished seminary, he got himself posted to Zambia where I was able to keep going back and forth. I became ordained uh, in North Katanga and fast forward some more, a good Congolese friend of mine ended up becoming the Bishop of North Katanga. And he invited me to be his assistant uh, basically all things Anglophone relations plus strategic partnership. And fast forward some more, even though I keep moving around the world, I go back as often as I can. Uh, the most recent photo in the bottom right is us all wearing our masks during the annual conference session in Kamina last summer. There are three books that I have been a part of that tell the bigger story since I won't be able to cover everything in this short amount. Uh, the first is a book my late father wrote, The Last Missionary, which was part memoir, part travel log, and part missiological treatise, where he shares the story of his journeys by bicycle with a team of Congolese pastors and reflects on what he's learned and what he wished the world would understand. Uh, the second is my doctoral uh, research, my thesis, which has been published, which focuses on the relational dynamics between American United Methodists and Congolese United Methodists from the North Katanga region and how those dynamics have shifted over the years. And then the final book, which we've signed a contract with just last month and will be coming out this spring. Uh, we, a, a friend and I were able to take my, the manuscript that my father had almost finished before he passed and we're now publishing it. Uh, it is a part two to The Last Missionary and I, I really think you'll like it. It's, it's great. So let's start on the academic conversation. 
We're gonna talk about decolonizing church partnerships. We need to first discuss what is colonialism. And I wanna go back to the conversations from the 1950s, particularly the book uh, written by Albert Memmi with the, had the introduction by Jean-Paul Sartre called The Colonizer and the Colonized. If you have never read this book, please do. It's a short read and it's an important read. And sadly, it is still, um, it's not very outdated. <laughs> it, it really applies today, sadly. Uh, so some of the main points from that book that I agree with. First of all, colonialism is more than an official political structure. It's about power dynamics and belief systems and so colonialism can continue even past it, the point in history where a country is officially free. Secondly, colonialism, at the heart of it, it's, it's about privilege. And so what you see in these colonial dynamics is that, uh, as Sartre put it beautifully, even the poorest colonizer thought himself to be superior. The colonialism dynamic means that any white person can show up in a colonized space and suddenly they are of a higher status rung than the most educated local. That's the colonial dynamic. The other important point is colonialism doesn't just harm those who are colonized. It also harms the soul of the colonizer. It, it, it's damaging to everyone. Colonialism also is a system. It's not something you can opt in or opt out of. When you're functioning in a colonial dynamic, you don't have the option of opting out. I, I learned this the hard way. When I first moved to Congo, I thought that I could somehow be in the other category. Um, and it doesn't work that way. It, you, you, can't, you can't opt out of the, the, the dynamic. And in the same way, we have conversations in the States that when you're functioning in a racist society, you can't opt out of the, privilege, the privileges or um, oppression that you experience. It's not a choice, you're stuck in the system. And so Meme talked about this myth that you could be somehow a benevolent European living in a colonized country and not be a colonizer. And he says, no, it doesn't matter how you feel in your heart. There's no option, there's no third option, you're trapped. He also says that if you are someone, if you are a colonizer who wants to decolonize, who wants to break out of this trap, you're doing it. And I love the way that he, he worded it. You know, it's exactly because their destiny is intertwined. That, that it's not about feeling sorry. It's not about sort of this, oh, I want to save others. It's, it's the recognition that I'm stuck in a system where I'm the bad guy. And so the only way out is to break the system. And then there's also the other dynamic that uh, the, of facing those who are the colonized. That to have a relationship with the colonizer creates a, a complex emotion of, of, of resentment and, and hate and self-loathing. And so we're all trapped in this mess. Now my very admittedly very oversimplified working definition of colonialism and neocolonialism is assumptions of moral and intellectual superiority plus power. Uh, 
yes, this is very similar to the working definition of racism. And that's a topic I would love to unpack on another day. But for the purposes of this conversation, our oversimplified working definition, assumptions of superiority plus power. Now, I've got a thing on my screen that's making it hard for me to read all the words, but that's okay. Oh, and I jumped ahead. Uh, that's okay. So the previous screen, which I need to jump across anyway, uh, was talking about sort of an example of colonialism from the beginning, uh, at the beginning of the 1900s, where where our rhetoric was just straight out empire and condescending. There was no there were no masks. There was no muting it. Uh, I, I found many many examples in my research of the way the church worded our mission efforts. So in Africa, the, the rhetoric of the 19, 19s and such was all about um, was all about the Christian crusade against the spread of Islam. And so the, the propaganda that was going out to the churches in main, at least in the mainstream white churches in America was that you want to support missionaries, white missionaries going to Africa to push back is the spread of Islam. And it was, there was language battle imagery, three fronts. Uh, that's why, for example, in the Methodist church, if you looked on a map of where there are the most Methodist churches on the continent of Africa, you'll see the, you'll see the band that goes right through the heart of Africa. And that was a tr strategic decision and it was all very much framed as, as warfare, as crusade language. And that's not to say that every missionary thought this way. They didn't, there were plenty of exceptions, but again, they were trapped in this system. The slide I have up right now is an example that came out of uh, a, a the Christian Advocate, which was the time a magazine of the Methodist Episcopal Church. This was 1949. I use these two images often when I speak with classes. And sometimes we spend quite a while just looking at these images and discussing them because there's so much to unpack in them. But briefly, you can see, you know, you've got the, again, the crusade to conquest language. You have the imagery of, you know, a family of all the girls are long and blonde and wearing what appears to be fur coats to a high steeple church. You've got the imagery of the uh, strong um, Superman physique, young boy, young man, early 20s, carrying the world's problems on his back and helping the feeble, needy world citizen. And if we had more time, there's so much to discuss with that. Uh, but again, this, is, this was the type of propaganda, colonial propaganda that was dominant in the mid 1900s in the white churches in America. Um, so let's move forward because these days, while blatant colonialism still exists, for the most part, what we see is neo-colonial behavior. Uh, our, rhetoric, let's say our rhetoric has shifted. So now we talk about partnerships. We love the word partnerships, uh, mutuality. The problem being that because so many churches haven't sat and really done the hard work of reflecting on their past, that the vocabulary changes, the semantics change, but the behavior doesn't. And that's starting 1960s all the way up today, we see this happening. So what am I talking about? Now, how can, you, how can this be identified concretely? So there is the assumptions of otherness, 
and there's still the unbalanced power dynamic. There is the one-sided mission as outreach approach uh, where you've got the giver and the recipient. Uh, common examples of this are mission trips or mission initiatives where it's the, the visiting team doing a bunch of manual labor or the visiting folks doing all the teaching or we are entertaining children or going to orphanages, distributing stuff, filling containers full of secondhand cast-offs, shipping it. Uh, it's all that doing for others. And again, it's not a conscious colonialism, but it's very much colonial in, in its unexamined assumptions and the effects. Again, the power imbalances. This neocolonialism often manifests as what we call the savior complex. Uh, very, very common, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. The other mark of these neo-colonial church partnerships is the lack of candidness and also the lack of long-term healthy friendships. One thing I, I've seen often that really just mm, pains me to no end is when you have uh, congregations, often they're mid-sized to large congregations that will do their annual church mission trip or their annual mission drive and they'll pick a congregation in a country and they'll go there. And then that congregation rolls out the welcome mat. They, um, unbeknownst to the American visitors, they end up spending more money than the American visitors bring in and what it costs them to, to, to roll out this welcome mat, to offer all this hospitality. They think what they're doing is investing in a long-term relationship and so then they're shocked when fast forward six months, they contact the missions pastor at that church who tells them, oh, sorry, you were our mission church last year, but you know, this year the congregation wants to go to Costa Rica. That's not a partnership, that's not a friendship. Uh, that's poverty tourism. And again, the other thing is the issue of this is you're undermining the dignity of local leadership. That's the real, the, the real, I think beneath all of it, at least for me, is neo-colonial church partnerships destroy dignity. Uh, I also highly recommend, it's a fairly short article if you've not read it, uh, Jord Rieger's uh, paper, Theology and Mission Between Neocolonialism and Postcolonialism. And he says a lot of stuff in there that I don't have time to talk about today, but one of the things he talks about is the function that this mission of outreach plays, that it, it, it gives, it's this outlet so that we can, we can, we can think we're doing good, we can alleviate, temporarily alleviate ourselves from this sense of guilt. And we're so focused on this helping others that we don't stop and ask questions about our own role in the underlying problem. We're so focused on helping the needy and bringing them food and we don't stop to ask, well, what's broken in the economy that they don't have food to begin with? And, and what is our role in that happening? You know, what does that have to do with the people we elect or the choices we make? Uh, so I wanna focus in, as I promised, on neocolonialism as savior complex. I identify as a recovering white savior. Just as someone might identify as a recovering alcoholic, I recognize that I will always be a recovering white savior, that that's always gonna be in the back of my brain and I'm always going to be pushing up against it. This, this 
this fantasy, this idea that I can somehow swoop in and help others, that I somehow have this magical either intellectual superiority or moral superiority, that there's something special about me and I can fix other people's problems. Uh, and if we're honest, most pastors deal with savior complexes. And we have to constantly remind ourselves that, you know, that job is taken. <laughs> we're not the savior. That job belongs to someone else. Uh, there is, a, I want to point you to, if you're not familiar with the work of Teju Cole, especially a piece he wrote for the Atlantic some years back on the white savior industrial complex. It wasn't specifically about the church, but I think it nails it quite well. Um, about the emotional needs that are satisfied by this volunteerism and these short-term mission trips, that, that really it's about someone from the US, someone who might be a nobody where they're from, gets to go somewhere else where people are poor and have their egos stroked and, and their feelings of guilt appeased, at least for the moment. And then they get to go home and say that they've been transformed and within a week they're back to their daily grind. Um, and so Cole points out that this, this, this savior, this white savior industrial complex, all of these do-gooder trips, both secular and within the church, rarely have anything to do with justice. Um, it's really about the emotional experience and the ego. Uh, so some common tropes. And if you said these before, that's okay. So have I. Uh, when, when, when church groups come back from their church mission partnership trips and describe, oh, the people I met, they were, they were poor, but they were so spiritual. They were poor, but they were so happy. Um, I feel like I received more than I gave, to which I always want to yell, because you did. You know, oh, they just loved me. They just met you. <laughs> they were being hospitable. My life has been transformed. And yet when you look, I, I've, I've looked at quite a few studies now that have been done on um, individuals and congregations after mission trips. And after you get to the six month point on, there's, you ask people to point to what exactly was transformed. Nothing really. It was an emotional high, but when they came back, their life didn't really change. Their behaviors didn't change. Um, they didn't put those lessons into advocacy for justice or transformation. So, and these are a couple resources because I figured this group are full of people who are teaching their own communities. It gets dicey, I've discovered, the hard way, naively, when you wanna give concrete examples of these. Um, nobody wants to have their congregations programs critiqued. So, um, most people find it pretty easy though to critique Barbie and we can poke fun at Barbie and criticize Barbie. There is a, a very witty Instagram site that was created a few years ago by a couple jaded aid workers uh, and they called it Barbie savior. And you can go and through a series of photos and hashtags, it's a whole story of Barbie going to generic Africa and doing all of the tropes. So Barbie goes and teaches in a class, a classroom in Africa, even though she has no teaching license or teaching experience. So again, we have assumptions of intellectual superiority. Why does Barbie think she's qualified to teach? Um, you've got Barbie going and bonding with orphans. You know, orphanages aren't a zoo. Attachment issues aren't cute. Um, there's, <laughs> there's, there's so much going on here. Do not, I, some people, I, I'm sure I confuse a lot of people in my life because on one hand, I am 
the first person to get on the soapbox about um, orphanages being bad news and a bad idea. Uh, and yet I also go every year that I can back to a specific orphanage in Congo. Because when I was living next door to those kids 16 years ago, I bonded with them. And I made a promise to them and to myself and to God that I was not going to add to their abandonment issues. And so the older ones, you know, <laughs> just as our talk was starting, I was getting some WhatsApp photos from some of them. It's not a perfect scenario. There's a lot of complications and I do not hold back the critiques I make on other orphanages against that one. But my relationship is with those kids and they know that I've got their back and it's a lifetime relationship. They weren't animals in a zoo I visited one summer. Uh, next, I wanna to touch upon the neocolonialism and being on the receiving end, uh, which I also call the unwritten rules. Because I have lived in seven countries now, and, and while I'm sort of, a, I'm an outsider insider, but I have been the person standing around watching, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Watching the parade, watching, the, watching all of the hustle and bustle and pr preparations for a church partner to come and visit. Um, I know the script, I, I've seen how things play out. And so some of those unwritten rules that those on the receiving end know, but those on the arriving end rarely are, rarely are aware of is first of all, you must shower the wealthy visiting church representatives with hyperbolic compliments. You must just tell them how wonderful they are and how grateful, you, you must just flood them with compliments. Uh, you can only show and tell them what you think would make them happy or move them to help your congregation. You cannot let them see the dirty laundry. You can't let them see your weak spots, um, anything shameful, anything that might scare them off or make them think that you're human and that you're a congregation of humans. You must be hyper spiritual and hyper happy. Thirdly, you must never let your church partners know the extent of the sacrifice you've made to provide them hospitality. They can't know the politics that were involved in procuring the best bedroom and the best house in the, in the village. They can't know any of that because that's showing them behind the curtain. And fourthly, you can never tell your wealthy church partners when they're doing harm, when they're being disrespectful, condescending. You can never tell them that they are, uh, what they're doing or saying is wrong, uh, that you disagree, because that could wound their fragile egos and the financial help will end. And so I get, and having seen this play out so many times in multiple places, I get so mad and have to bite my tongue whenever I hear um, congregations in the US complaining that their partners in X country aren't being transparent or you know, need to be more honest or need to be more this or that. And I just wanna say, well, they aren't telling you the truth because they don't think you can handle the truth. They suspect probably correctly that you're a fair weather friend. And if you ever wanna form a healthy partnership, you're gonna to have to get past that. Um, so next book or books, that I say, please, please, please go out and buy right now. Anything by the Christian ethicist, Samuel Wells. Uh, the first thing you can do is hop online for free. You can list, you can read his sermon, Re Rethinking Service. 
If that sermon speaks to you, immediately download a Nazareth Manifesto. Every class I've taught this book in, the students have just, that, that's been the favorite book. Um, it is extremely powerful. He's written many other books, all of them are superb. The main assertion he makes that I think it's important for this conversation, and this is the main point he makes in his sermon rethinking service. Most of our societies teach us that the fundamental problem of the human condition is mortality, that we're fragile beings who are going to die. And so we structure all of our do-gooding efforts into addressing this problem. So healthcare, housing, uh, food and clothing, uh, and Wells doesn't really go into this, at least not in anything I remember him writing, but I would say the church, we also try to present our, present Christ as the solution. So the problem is mortality, Christ is the solution. With Christ, you don't die. Everything is focused around the problem. And Wells says, I think we've got it wrong. I don't think mortality is the main problem. I think isolation is. And he, he beautifully unpacks that um, on, in, in tangible, pragmatic ways, theological ways about isolation, about uh, the role Christ plays in addressing isolation and, and reconnecting us, the atoning work with uh, connecting us with God, with one another. And the, the thing that Wells talks about that is really important, it's not that addressing mortality issues is bad. It's not that it's bad or wrong to bring a hungry person food. It's not that it's wrong to say that with Christ, we have everlasting life. The problem is, is when we focus on that as, as the problem, we often unintentionally heighten isolation. That we take away people's dignity. In the process of doing for people, we take away their dignity. In the process of telling people, oh, focus on what's gonna happen after you die, we, we fail to acknowledge the suffering they're going through right now. And the isolation, the alienation, the abandonment they're feeling right now. Tying this in, what does this have to do with decolonizing church partnerships? I say our church partnerships need to focus on isolation. And another way of saying that is our church partnerships need to be grounded in friendship. A healthy church partnership is a healthy friendship. And what are the marks of a genuine friendship? These are things we already know. And if you speak with people in your congregation and ask people, what's it mean to be a real friend? People know this. We know this and yet somehow we forget it. You know, Commitment from this day forward, for better, for worse. That's what a real friend is. Vulnerability, the ability to share with others our less than perfect self and the ability to give our friend honest feedback. That requires trust that it's safe to do that, that it's safe to say these things to the other person. Communication. Knowing another requires respectful listening and sharing over an extended period of time. And dignity and respect, the being with instead of the doing for, that a real friendship is a two-way street. Now, I would love, but I recognize that I'm out of time and we need to switch to discussions tell you about the story of Friendly Planet. Uh, instead, I would say, please read the book, The Last Missionary. And uh, I think you will be blessed by it. It, it really is um, a powerful story of what it means 
to build a cross-cultural friendship? And what happens when you put addressing alienation and abandonment as your priority? When you get on bicycles as a team and go visit the pastors and the communities that have been cut off? And I'll just give you one sample. I'll end with one sample from the book, The Last Missionary. Step one, listen. You listen, then you listen some more. And when you think, I'm gonna pause for a moment just to get out of, oh, it won't let me do that, okay. How about Bill? Oh, darn it, there we go. Bill, why don't you read it aloud? All right. <clears throat> Step one, listen. You listen, then you listen some more. When you think you know something, stop yourself from speaking and listen some more. Listen until what you thought you know is no longer what you know. Listen until you know nothing at all. Let everything you thought you knew fade into nothingness. Listen with your whole body and soul. Don't talk. Listen. Step one will take months, years. It's common in a um, patronage system that all parties have bought into a story that explains the problems that only serves to reinforce the problems. The listener has to get to the other side of the story. Thanks, Phil. So I'll, my closing screen, again, those are the books um, that would that say more of what I'd like to say. And if I can get, there we go. Now my laptop's cooperating. <laughs> Back to gallery mode. And let's have a conversation. Okay. I, go ahead, Marlene. Okay. All right. Um, I, I am a Jamaican, um, and I, I don't know if you know that of the history of Jamaica in terms of, you know, colonialism. You do? Yes. So um, we, we, are, we are actually, we are not over 90% Black, but not really purely Black. You know, we are mixed, not like Africans. We are mixed because of the, the, yeah. the you know, the dynamics of our culture. But um, our history is is one where we we were we were we were um, abused, uh, taken, you know, over the the um, the passage um, from England by the Europeans here through inhumane um, circumstances and placed on plantations and so forth and the whole process until we got independence. But um, in terms of our culture, it would be interesting. And, you know, I had um, I promoted this on another platform where, you know, there, there are a number of Africans and, and Bakke also has a number of you know, Africans that I would have, you know, it could have been interesting, made, made interesting conversation if we had you know, because colonialism, when we talk about colonialism, we usually speak of African black people, but it's not, it happened in China, it happened in, it, it happened in the US, it happened in, in other, a number of countries have had um, this um, similar, similar experience. And, but black people think that it's just, it's just us, you know? And um, but I, I just want to say that in terms of your of your views that you have expressed here, um, we know we are aware that missionaries and, and there are a lot of white persons who have helped. And I, and I just want to express this because we have had this conversation, you know, and I even saw uh, um, uh, uh, um, what's it called now? It, it's a movie. It's not a movie. It is um, one that you 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 love. What's comedy, right? Um, a black comedy, U.S. black comedy, which speaks about um, slavery. And one comment was that um, 
if we didn't have slavery, right? Many of us, such as Jamaicans, wouldn't be where we are now, most likely. Um, maybe would have been somewhere in Africa, you know, still suffering. And um, and and so and so and there so and there are some and I am I I am of that view to be honest, you know I'm a, I'm of that view I don't I'm not saying and that was the conversation, I'm not saying that slavery was was good right and it and and that I'm saying that it should have happened and it's the cause of it but I'm saying that God makes good out of the bad right and so the black persons who have suffered and have been um, displaced into other countries, such as Jamaica, the West Indies, have benefited from, from this because God has the missionaries there, as you have indicated, their intent and their approaches were wrong, but God was there from the beginning, right? Because the Africans at the time, many of them were not Christians, they were worshiping foreign gods. And God, although Christianity in itself came from as its origin in, in Africa, obviously they moved away from God. And God, I, I, in my view, God used this that, that the devil had, had implemented to save his people who he loved, which are us, and he loves everybody else. And I, and I also want to say that, um, that there are persons who, who may have bad feelings towards those who are white based on slavery and Americans and Europeans and so forth. And you, you, you yourself, it, it comes out that you are saying that, you know, the approach is not good. But at the same time, you know, I am still saying that yes, it's the it's the it's the the, the, the man you being human that is putting the bad part in it. That's what's coming out in terms of your what your presentation. But the intent is for the spreading of the gospel, and so I think that is one of the blessings of America. Right, that your make your white people, despite of the fact that they haven't done it right, and that is the human part. God wanted them to go, and they went. Right, and and Africa is 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 their Christianity is no um, getting spreading in Africa, and I'm sure that many of them are grateful to to, to those persons who who have not done it right, but God will make it right. Right. So Marlene, is there a question in there somewhere? There's a lot to respond to there. I'm not sure where I would start. I guess maybe I'm just making a statement. Um, <laughs> no, the, the, well, the question is, yeah, I have a question. The, the question is, um, for example, the Jesuits, I don't know if you'll go back to that, you know, in terms of the Jesuits, the Roman Catholics, who came, who went in um, the, the, the the Africa as a as a colonial country, the West Indies, um, and I guess also in the in in the in the, well in the U.S. Um, in terms of their intent, um, many persons don't think that they. They they, 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 they they were they were truly Christians. It's it it it, it was um it, it's in our records that 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 the intent was just to keep the the um the 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 the, the slaves docile and so that they, they are obedient and won't um won't rebel against the, the regime. So what what is your view of that? Was was it that they really wanted to Christianize, or it is just to use Christianity as a tool of slavery? Well, so for that question, I'll go back to history is messy. Yes, it is. And 
were there some people who just played at being Christian in order to dominate? Yes, of course. Yes. Were there people who had truly pure intentions, but often got it wrong because they were trapped in a system that made it impossible to do it right? Yeah. Uh, so, and I, and I want to make that clear whenever I talk about the issues of colonialism and mission and neocolonialism and mission. I'm not calling, I'm, I'm not calling it a moral failure, moral failure of individuals. Uh, especially now where, you know, we, we've fixed the rhetoric, we've fixed our words, but our behaviors haven't changed which means there's a whole section of our motivations that we're unaware of. There's a whole system and dynamic that we're unaware of. And what I'm trying to say to people isn't that I think you're a bad person or I think you're a bad Christian. What I'm trying to say is you grew up in a, we all grew up in a messy system, in a dysfunctional system. And, and we were taught things that weren't right. And it's our responsibility to unteach ourselves, to unpack that and to share what we learn with others. Uh, you know, going back at, with the Jesuits and the purpose, I mean, there's, that's why there's a difference between talking about things on a systematic level and an individual level. Individuals have mixed motivations across the, all over. I, I can't even say spectrum because it's bigger than that. But when you start to look at systems and power holders, um, then yes, you can have a conversation about, you know, was the, the institutional church in bed with the power holders? Was there was there a collaboration to oppress? Was, was there a deliberate use of missionaries to, to hold in check populations? Yes. Uh, but did those individual missionaries mean to do that? Did they understand that they were pawns in the system? Not always, often not. Uh, just as even today, we often don't understand that we're pawns in a system. And, and that's the important important thing is to help people to understand the dynamics going on and it's hard it, it, it's it's you know sometimes it's like insulting mom and apple pie uh, you got to be really careful because you know somebody's beloved aunt poured millions of dollars into that uh, but it's important we have to have these conversations because moving forward we need to have a healthy cross-cultural friendships and to collaborate and address social issues. And that's how we get transformation in society. Yeah, and forgiveness, Taylor. forgiveness, understanding and so forth, sorry. Taylor, and forgiveness you... is not cheap grace. <laughs> <laughs> could you give us some examples, Taylor, of how you have seen those systems altered when you've gone into a you know, missionary setting in Africa, um, you know, whichever place you've lived that that might have happened. Could you give us just a couple of small examples of how you've, you know, uh, collaborated and worked and coordinated with, you know, the powers that be? <laughs> well, so the, the area that I did my doctoral research in was, was a much smaller group. I was looking at the North Katanga United Methodist um, Conference which is a, a subsection of Katanga region, was a subsection of Congo, and did a lot of interviews with uh, church leaders there, as well as with a number of American Methodists who have been involved in, in various ways and partnerships, um, some as missionaries, but some as visitors and other things. And one of the interesting things that came out of that was the realization that my Congolese colleagues were decolonizing their minds at a much more rapid rate than the Americans. Mm -hmm. um, th that it wasn't the Congolese who needed to be preached to about, you know, get over your inferiority complex. Uh, complex. 
know, that process had already started. Uh, I mean, in some ways it had started um, from the beginning that there's always been people who have, who have seen the system and rejected it. But especially in the past 25 years, when I did interviews and we talked about it, there, we, we've got the word Mzungu, which is similar to the word gringo. There, it's, it's, it, it means white person in a sense, but it's a very yeah. loaded, it's a very loaded word. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very emotionally loaded word. Uh, and what I found was that the Congolese I interviewed, pretty much all of them were able to articulate a shift that had happened. That when they were young, they thought and the community thought that if you wanted anything done right, you needed a white person, that white people were intrinsically smarter and better and everything superior. And that they've come to realize that that's a lie. <laughs> that they are just as intelligent and just as capable and they can do it themselves. Uh, now, and, and again, you know, Marlene, you talk about how sometimes good things can come out of terrible things. What's that the, war Congo, the war in Congo, which was a terrible thing, millions of lives lost. One of the things that happened was that most of the foreigners fled for their lives. And if had they had stayed, they probably would have been killed. But what that meant was then you've got this nearly 20 year window now where the Congolese United Methodists have had to completely step into everything because there's no more white foreign missionaries running the show. And, and yes, yeah, some balls have been dropped, some things have collapsed. You got you know, people stepping into a position that they never received training for or programs that were never really designed to be sustainable because you need to you need to get the parts from the 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 engine plant down in South Indiana for or else that they eventually wear out. But what I saw was for them, going back to your question, they had made that transition. That's good. But but on the American end, that that shift really hadn't happened much. The, the Americans were, were for on the most part again blanket statement doesn't apply to every individual, but for the most part, they were unaware of this dramatic shift that had happened in the relationship dynamic. And unaware that certain games weren't going to be played anymore. Uh, and it has, it has shifted the relationship. Uh, little things that you can say, for example, now that the current bishop, Bishop Monde Muyombo, who has spent part of his life in Congo, part in Zimbabwe, he's lived in New York and Atlanta. Yes, we still seek funding assistance because he's most of his churches are in communities that are really economically depressed and struggling and rebuilding from a war. But when we have our visitors come, uh, we invite them to do things that they're actually qualified to do. So when we have pastor school, the the, the American speakers are all people who actually speak on these topics in seminaries in the US. They're not just <laughs> random, they, they have experience teaching these things. And at the same time, we, he sets it up so that they teach alongside Congolese scholars. And so the dynamic in the school is that the Congolese scholars are treated with equal respect as the American scholars that the American and Congolese scholars learn from each other and that the people attending the school see someone of their own being treated at the same level of scholarly respect as an outsider. And so everyone learns from the experience, friendships are built, networks are made, yes, money is raised, uh, but it's a heck of a lot healthier. That's great. All right, we have done an hour, which was oh, probably yes, 45 yeah. minutes, but it's been fabulous. Taylor, this is just so eye-opening, frustrating as well, um, yes. uh, but a, a, an amazing presentation. Thank you so much. I've um, Gina, I already bought the book. Taylor, I'll be down to buy uh, a couple of the books and definitely want to read some of Samuel Wells, and I appreciate that. I'm familiar with all of it, so um, really very, very helpful.
Um, you know, Taylor, you're, you're, you're ordained elder. I bet you can pray. You pray us out of here and we will go our separate ways. Thank you. Gracious God, thank you for this opportunity for us to gather together. Thank you for the BGU leadership for making this possible. Thank you for the technology that allows us to come together even though we are physically sitting in different countries. God, I pray that the words I've shared to this evening were acceptable to you and that they will be used to touch hearts and minds in order to build and transform and strengthen your kingdom here on earth. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Taylor, thank you. Fabulous. I appreciate it. I appreciate you all being you here. Guys. And um, <laughs> we'll see you all again soon. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Taylor. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. Thanks, Marlene. <laughs> thank you for being here. Bye.